But this past uh, week, um, a Bible was removed from a waiting room um, by the Veteran Affairs Medical Center in Athens, Ohio. A veteran complained, our government is secular and must remain secular. And said, uh, he said, uh, the, my, Mickey Weinstein, the founder of a Military Religious Freedom Foundation, fired off a letter to the medical center on behalf of the veteran alleging the presence of a Bible inside a government facility is a violation of the U.S. Constitution. Can you imagine that? He said, uh, um, Weinstein, a fussy man with a strong aversion to our Lord and the Bible's placement in the waiting room was said it was illicit and unconstitu unconstitutional. In other words, good housekeeping is fine, but the good book is not. Uh, it's all right to have everything but the Bible. I'm finding more and more that that is becoming common. It's not uncommon, it's becoming common. I want you to turn your Bibles to Romans chapter 1, and I know I've used this scripture uh, before, but I, I really feel like this is the message for today. In Romans chapter 1, We'll begin reading in verse number 14, Romans chapter 1. A young girl got saved at a powerful revival. She came home. Got saved, was so excited, and her grandpa saw her in the house after revival, and she was singing and dancing and spinning around on a Sunday afternoon, and he rebuked her sternly and said, you just, you just became a Christian, and here you are, acting like that on the Lord's Day. She walked outside, kind of distraught, Walked out through the yard, finally made it to the barn. She looked and there was an old mule standing out there. An old mule had just got through eating some old briars and just had an old sour look on his face. She looked at him and says, I guess you got the same kind of religion that Grandpa got. <laughs> you know, being a Christian is not something to endure, it's something to enjoy. It ought to be when you see these beautiful days that God has given and you look up, the Bible says that the handiwork of God, you cannot help but look up and see, oh, what a great God we serve. For those of us that are Christians, if you've ever been to the Smoky Mountains and you see what God did and you see those beautiful leaves, it looks like they're on fire lit up this time of the year looking at those mountains. My goodness, you say, oh, how great God is. You've been to the ocean and seen those waves and those white caps roll in and how God keeps them in their bounds. And you say, oh, how great God is. I think this is getting to be the time of the year that's an atheist's worst time of the year. Because it's coming up on Thanksgiving and they don't know who to thank. They just feel like everything is as it always has been. But the passage today talked about says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. There's a lot of things that we ought to be ashamed of. Amen? But I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. The Bible says in Romans 10 verse 11, it said, For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. The Bible says, For whosoever shall be ashamed of me and of my words, of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he shall come in his own glory and in his fathers and of the holy angels. That's in Luke 9, 26. The Bible talks about that if you're ashamed of me, he'll be ashamed of us. You say, well, preacher, as time grows near and it seems like at one time in America, being a Christian 
was something that people stood up and said, yes, sir, I'm a Christian and proud of it. I remember a time where people ran for office, even the highest office of the land. They were seen singing in choirs. They were seen at national prayer breakfasts. Breakfasts, I guess. <laughs> How do you say that? They were seen in places because they wanted to be seen because they knew that Christians had a major force in this country. We're living in a day now that folks can boldly speak against the name of Christ, speak for immorality, and people still don't even blush. We're living in a day, but Christ talks about us not being ashamed of our Savior. I'm not ashamed of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm not ashamed of anything that He has ever done. When He said, He was reading the words of that song, He has a great memory, by the way, to be able to quote all those words to that song over and over and over again. And He, and he just kept going, and He was saying it in cadence with the, with the song and with the music. If you've never done that before, that's hard. And I was thinking of all the words he was saying and, and he was talking about how that, that as the blood he spilled it out, he was saying, this blood is for you. I did kind of think it strange that when he said, Simon, this blood's for you. And we know that's the one that denied Christ. He looked at me, amen. I, I, I was like, yeah, I'm preaching on being ashamed of the Lord. Thanks a lot, Amen. He looked at Peter and said, before that rooster crows, you'll deny me three times today. He talks about being ashamed. I think Peter was fearful for his life. I think Peter was scared that they was going to do to him what they'd done to Jesus. He was scared. But I also think it hit him in his core when he done what he done. He realized what he had done. But he said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. I'm not ashamed of my Savior. I'm not ashamed of the life he gives to the dying. Romans 6, 21 said, there are some things, and it talks about men should be ashamed of. It said, what fruit had ye in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. I wrote down here, I said, the church has gotten so culturally correct, it's scared to call sin, sin. <laughs> People have no moral compass. The church used to be a place where folks at least heard what was sin. <laughs> you say, well, people still sin. I know, but at least the church was the beacon and the trumpet still sounding out that there was some rights and wrongs in our culture in which we live. There is some things that we should be ashamed of. Amen. The child molester should be ashamed of his actions. The adulterer should be ashamed of his or her actions. Amen. The drunkard should be ashamed of their actions. The blasphemer should be ashamed of his actions. The liar should be ashamed of their actions. But there is some things that we don't have to be ashamed of. Say, preacher, you have things in your life you're ashamed of? Absolutely. Say, what are they? I'm not telling you. <laughs> You don't tell me yours, I won't tell you mine. I used to have a guy that used to, to come tell me all the time. I, I knew by what he told me what his besetting sin was. The Bible talks about it, and, you know, and talking about the besetting sin means we all have certain sins we struggle with, but I could tell by what he was talking about all the time to me what his besetting sin was, and he wanted to confess it to me. He kept saying, Preacher, I just have a problem with a certain sin in my life, and I said, Won't you tell it to Jesus? 
He wanted to tell me so bad what it was, but I wouldn't let him tell me because I told him, I said, look, don't confess your sins to me. You can confess faults, but don't confess your sins. I can't do anything with my sins. I can't, I know I can't do anything with yours. There is one that we need to confess to. We need to confess it to him and say, God, you know what? I'm still ashamed when I say what I shouldn't say, when I do what I shouldn't do, when I think what I shouldn't think, when I go where I shouldn't go. You know, it'd still be good for us to go before the face of an almighty God in our prayer closet and say, God, <laughs> it's not for your wife or your, your husband or your parents or your grandparents or your grandchildren but it'd be good every once in a while us just to kneel before an almighty God where nobody can hear and say, Dear God, I've said some things I shouldn't have said today and I've thought some things I shouldn't have thought today. And dear God, I am ashamed of what I've done before you. I, I've been washed in your blood and cleansed and I am your child, O oh God. But God, I'm not living like your child today. You know, it'd be good for us to get clean sometime just in the sight of God. If you hadn't done that lately, I want you to know it sure is a good, it is a free feeling when God says, you know what? If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I love it when God looks down and said, I've known all of that and I loved you anyway, but I'm so glad that me and you agree. <laughs> on what you've thought, what you've said, what you've done. But I'm not ashamed of the life he gives to the dying soul. Jeremiah 6.15 says, Were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? Nay, they were not at all ashamed, neither could they blush. Therefore shall they fall among them that fall at the time that I visit them shall they be cast down, saith the Lord. You know, it's almost fire to find anybody can blush anymore. We've been so desensitized to sin in our day and time. It's pretty good every once in a while to see somebody be like, oh my goodness, I can't believe. I remember when folks just about would punch somebody in the mouth for cussing around their wife. Say amen. Amen. Now the wife's just about to throw a cussing on them just as much as anybody will. Say, oh me. <laughs> but uh, some examples. Let me give you some examples of a person that decided not to be ashamed. And one of the greatest guys that missionaries had ever lived was Hudson Taylor. He actually is known to bring the gospel to China. He was born in 1832. That's a long time ago, amen? That's before last week. That's, uh, I'm trying to think if that's older than Hopewell. That's close. Four years younger than Hopewell. Hudson Taylor was born after Hopewell was founded. I should have just asked Fred. He probably remembers the birth announcement back when Hudson was born. Amen. But he died in the 20th century before going out to China. He was, before he was out there, he went to an area and he actually had to take a job and he was acting as a nurse, some medical student and a district nurse in London. And he would give people medical care. And God had already moved on him to be a missionary. And there was a young man that he wanted to go see. And somebody had already said he was a devout atheist. And he didn't believe about him. God didn't want nothing to do with God. And old Hudson kind of got, a, got a, something in his soul said, go talk to him. He said he went to go talk to him. And they said that, when he walked in, he says he didn't go as a, as a missionary. He went as a nurse to go. And the guy had uh, gangrene on his feet. And he went in and Hudson Taylor wanted to speak and wanted to talk to him about his Lord. But he said that God wouldn't let him do it. All he would let him do 
is take care of the wound on his foot. He had to go day after day to change the dressing and to clean it out again and again, trying to do it. And after a while, he had been going day after day after day. Finally, God opened the door. And he started talking to him and he said, the man, a devout atheist, turned his back to him when he started talking to him. He had run everybody else off, but he didn't run him off because he knew he needed his help. He turned his back to him. He'd share with him just a word about the Lord and leave. The next day he would come and this went on and he would take care of the dressing and he would do what he had to do and he'd go to speak about the Lord and the man would clench his teeth and, and turn away from him right when he would go to speak of him. He said this went on day after day after day after day and he finally went one day and was going to talk to him and at the end of the day he thought about the scripture says if he won't receive his word to shake the dust off his feet he says, and he tried to say, i have just done with it. I've done what all I can do and started to leave. And when he started to leave, he said all he could picture was him going off into a devil's hell. And Hudson Taylor turned around and with tears streaming down his face, he said, I've tried just to turn you over, but I can't do it. I don't want you to die and go to hell. Please, please, please hear my message. He said it wasn't but about a week later. The Bible said, He that goeth forth weeping, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. He said it about a week later. He said that old hardened man became a Christian. And Hudson realized, you know what? We've got to not be ashamed to speak of his name, no matter what the outcome, no matter what somebody does to you. We cannot be ashamed to speak his name. It's your workforce where you work sometimes speaking the name of Christ is not politically correct. But it's always correct. <laughs> sometimes at school you're told, you know what? It's not the right thing to do. It's never the wrong thing to do. I have found out that when people don't want to hear anything about the Bible... A lot of times they still have needs in their life that they want you to pray about. They want you to be able to talk to them. They are hurts in their life and God has things in their life. They're facing just what you're facing. And you'll be surprised that God puts you in a place to be right there. Justin actually helped me with this when he was here. I liked, and uh, you know, the, we can learn from one another. Justin told me when he goes up to somebody's house, talk to him, before he had left, he always asked him, is there anything going on in your life that you'd like me to pray about before I leave? And I thought, you know what? What a great thing. We, the Bible says that we, as children of God, if you're a Christian, the Bible says that you are a priest of the Most High God. You say, a priest? Yeah, that means you go in, in on somebody else's behalf before God. If you're a child of God, you have the right to go into the presence of God and they may not even be saved. They may be out of the will of God and they may not have access to his presence until they come to know him. And God can use you, use you to be their go-between, to carry their requests to the very throne of mercy and help. Years ago in my own life, I was, man, I was seeing people saved, seeing things happen. And, and actually, my grandma went by her house one day, and I lived several hours from her. And I happened to be home, and I was preaching, doing things. And I said, Mama, pray for me. She says, I have by name every day of your life. And I thought, I said, you know what? I wonder how many times people has carried my name before the throne of God and found intercession and mercy and help that I had no idea that they had carried me to the throne of God. I'm not ashamed to call those folks my brethren. And God says he's not ashamed of those things. Many have said I'm not ashamed to suffer for Christ. There's a movie that just came out this week that says I'm not ashamed. It's the name of it. And it's about the Columbine shooting. And a little girl that decided, it's based on a true story, the true story of the Columbine 
massacre that happened. And a young girl that decided that she wanted to make a difference for Christ. And if it took her very life, she was willing to lay it down if need be. She did lay it down. And at the end, it tells you the number of untold people that has come to know Christ because of her sacrifice. And I thought, you know what? If a little old girl can say, God, whatever it takes, use me. Brother Sam preached down in Slidell, Louisiana. He'll never forget, he told the story, and I knew the lady. She actually was there in the search of her and her husband, and her husband had been converted, and, and his family was lost. They was just lived like heathens and he was worried about his family and he had two little girls and he got on fire for God and he said, I, I want my family to be saved, preacher. And he prayed and prayed and prayed. Brother Sam said he still remembers it. He said he'd come forward one Sunday. He said, preacher, he said, I'm praying that if it even takes my very life to see my family saved, I'm willing to give it. I don't want my family to die and go to hell. He said it wasn't very long after that. He was up at the church working one day and he says, here comes a car and somebody said, so and so, talking about that man has just been hit in an automobile accident and he's dead and you got to go with us. We got to go see his wife and his two little girls and tell her what's happened. Brother Sam said he took off to the house to tell her what had happened. And at the funeral, 24 of his family members trusted Christ as their Lord and Savior. His wife said, I knew I used to hear the prayers of my husband praying for his family to be saved. She said at the funeral when 24 of his family was saved, I didn't know whether to weep or to rejoice. She said, I found myself weeping where I couldn't control it and giggling and happy at the same time that God had answered his request. Listen, folks, this life is only a vapor. Amen. It's here for a little while and then it's over. But eternity is forever and forever and forever and forever. Someone has said that a bird could fly from the east coast to the west coast and get one grain of sand. And when he wiped out all the beaches along the coastline from flying one grain from one coast to the other and dropping it, when he's emptied the coast, of all the sand, eternity has just begun. <laughs> I don't know about you, I'm kind of glad I'm headed to a place that has no expiration date on it, amen? Many have said, I'm not ashamed to suffer for Christ. Did you know the word martyr in Greek is also translated witness in English? You say, I want a witness for Christ. He said, all right. Through life or through death, I want to be a witness for Christ. In, in Cyrus, the founder of the Persian Empire, once captured a prince and his family. And when they came before him, the monarch asked the prisoner, said, what will you give me if I release you? He said, half of my wealth was his reply. And if I release your children, everything I possess. And I release your wife. He said, your majesty, I will give myself. Cyrus was so moved by his devotion that he freed them all. And as they returned home, the prince said to his wife, wasn't Cyrus a handsome man? <laughs> With a deep look of love for her husband, she said, I didn't notice. I could only keep my eyes on you, the one who was willing to give himself for me. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. You say, how do you do that? You keep your eyes on the one that gave himself for you. The Bible says, greater love hath no man than this 
Let a man lay down his life for his friends. There is actually the story of a Roman legion that was actually around a little over 300 A.D. And they said that there was a, a it happened at Sabaste, There was a frozen lake there, and they said that the commander had gotten order from Rome that everybody was supposed to sacrifice to a pagan deity. Christianity had spread at that time, and some of the Roman soldiers had become Christians. And they said that these particular region or legion, this, this group had 40 soldiers that had received Christ and said they would give their armor and even their lives to Rome but they would not sacrifice to a pagan deity. They would not give Rome their soul. The commander told them, he said well you know what has to happen. And they said that, that he ordered them to strip down naked and go out onto a frozen lake. And he says, when you're ready to recant your Christian faith, you can come off the ice and be warm. And they said as they was out there, he watched them as they marched back and forth, freezing to death, marching for Christ. And one by one, they began to fall and freeze. And one by one, until the last one there was there and came running to the bank and said, I recant, I recant, I'll do it, I'll do it. Little did they know the commander had been on the edge of accepting Christ all the time. And they said that when the young man came off the ice, that the commander, the officer, took his clothes dropped them and walked out on the eyes and said, I guess I'll have to take this place and became a believer and follower of Christ. That's weird. You know what? We need some folks that say, you know what? I'm just not ashamed. I'm just not ashamed. Preacher gives an invitation and asks folks to come forward and give their life to Christ. The devil says, don't do it in front of all those people. Oh my goodness. One day we'll stand before millions, on top of millions, on top of millions. And your name will be called. And you will not have a choice of whether or not you will stand before his presence in that name. My word to you is it's better to kneel on this side of eternity than it is to be forced to kneel on the other side of eternity. You can go forever. In your place, I'll be. Let's say, Father, in Jesus' name, take the message today and bless it. Lord, I don't know the need of the hour, but I do know this. God, I know that the heat is turning up against Christians. I understand that. I see it, God. I believe it's the sign of the times. I believe that you're coming. But dear God, we don't have something to endure. We have something to enjoy having life in Christ. Lord, I read this week, God, of many people, God, down through the ages that chose to walk with you even over the ultimate sacrifice. And dear God, I pray that today your people will say I'm not ashamed. I pray that they be so wise to say I'm not ashamed of my Savior. I pray that they be some husbands to say I'm not ashamed to say after me in my house to serve the Lord. Dear God, I pray that they be some young people to say I'm not ashamed to stand for my Lord. God, I ask you to take this message today and bless